Hi everyone, in today's video, we are going to be talking more about the future of medications used to treat schizophrenia, what that might look like, what we can expect in years to come. And we have Matthew Ellswood, a pharmacist based in the UK, joining us today to share about his expertise and insights into this topic. Matthew currently works for Nottinghamshire Healthcare in the UK, and he also advises the NHS on mental health pharmacy issues. I'm so excited to hear more from Matthew about this topic, and without further ado, here he is. All right, so hi again, Matt. Thank you so much for joining us again for our second video with you. And this one is going to be on the future of medication use for schizophrenia. So thank you so much for being here again today with us. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. So I guess just to get into it, how are psychiatric medications developed? And so how long does it take? How are they tested? What is the process for that? Yeah, sure. So I'm going to have to take you um, back and in, in, uh, do a little bit of a short history lesson here. So... Um, the truth is that, that some of the first medicines we use to treat people with mental health problems, including psychosis, were discovered through a process of serendipity. So they were kind of discovered by accident. Um, so there's a medicine called chlorpromazine, and it was initially designed uh, for use when people were having surgical procedures to help them to stay calm. And what some of the clinicians noticed was that people with mental health problems um, seem to be calmer and more settled in terms of their mental health problems, not just the surgery, so that people noticed that. And that started off a process of scientific inquiry. And I'll, I'll come back to that process in a minute. But, but also some of the first antidepressants that were found were actually used as treatments for tuberculosis. And again, um, clinicians who were watching their patients very cleverly noticed that if they had someone with tuberculosis and depression, not only would their tuberculosis hopefully improve, but they would get less depressed also. So these are examples of serendipity where we find things that seem to work by accident. Um, and then a, a process of scientific inquiry starts and and lots of people go into the laboratories and they do all of these tests and they find out, right, well, how are these medicines working and what are they doing in the body? And in particular, what are they doing in the brain that's improving uh, the mental health conditions? And over time, what they do is they identify a target. And the target is typically um, an enzyme or a receptor in, in the body. And what we learn is if we block that receptor or if we block that enzyme or if we activate uh, a receptor, that a certain set of symptoms improve. And that leads to a process called rational drug design. And what the, 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 the pharmaceutical industry companies then do and, and scientists and laboratories is they try and very cleverly design a medicine, a little molecule that will go in and hit that target. Um, and not just that, but they will hit that target and do as little as possible else. Um, because what you really want is something that's specific that only does what you want it to do. Uh, but as we talked about when we talked about side effects, um, quite a lot of these targets are microscopic. They're very similar to a whole bunch of other targets and things that exist in the body. Uh, so it's very difficult to design an extremely specific uh, medicine, which is why medicines often, along with the, the good effects that we want them for, have side effects and, and they often do other things also. Um, so that's, that's, that's a kind of a brief overview of where these medicines come from. Um, they go through a series of rigorous trials, actually. Um, so it starts with something called phase one trials, where they're really examining the safety of the medicine. So is it broadly speaking safe? And they'll give it to a very small number of subjects um, to, to, to establish its safety profile. And if it is acceptable, then it moves on to phase two. Um, and then they're really looking to see, well, does it work? So then they give it to more subjects and they examine its efficacy. Does it work? Uh, and then, you know, if it's looking good from a safety and efficacy perspective, then they move on to phase three studies. And those are really bigger studies, much more people involved. And what they're doing then is they're saying, okay, we think we've got a treatment that works. We need to compare it against what we would consider a gold standard to see how it shapes up compared to something that we already know works really well. So these, these medicines go through lots of different phases um, and kind of lots of different trials. And as time goes on, 
uh, more and more people take them, so we learn more and more about them. But actually, what's also true is that once a drug is on the open market, it's gone through all of its trials and it's got a license, we keep learning. So um, to give an example, it was a number of years before we identified that uh, the medicine clozapine could cause some problems with blood tests and blood cell generation. Uh, so people that take that now have to have regular blood tests so that we can see what's happening and make sure that if that's there, that you know that we can address it. But it took, it took a long time and for a number of people to have clozapine before that became something that we were aware of. Mm-hmm. And that's very common, actually. The more people try a medicine, the more that we learn about it. And the more that people take a medicine, the more we learn about the slightly rarer side effects that they can cause. Um, so over here, what we do is when a medicine is new and when it joins the market, there's a lot more vigilance around that medicine. And it might be the same in, in Canada. Um, so we have black triangle drugs, and that's just a way of us knowing as, as pharmacy professionals that um, if anyone has any side effect whatsoever, even if it's a really common one that we already know about and they're taking a black triangle drug, then we have to report that. It's called pharmacovigilance. And that's the way that the drug company builds up all of this information about what the, what the medicines do in practice. And that's, that's how the information over time gets more fulsome and more helpful. Right. Well, that's helpful. Cool. Um, So I guess what types of drug treatment therapies are currently in development for schizophrenia and how are they differing from what's currently available? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, So in truth, uh, there aren't, uh, there there probably are a lot of um, medicines in the early stages of development for psychosis in schizophrenia. Uh, But if I was to look out for the next two to five years, I'm not sure that we'll see any new treatments for psychosis and schizophrenia in England Um, that, It's not unusual for America to to start using some medicines before they come over the pond to us. So it may be that there's something um, closer to getting a license in the States than than over here. And I I don't really know how it is in Canada. Maybe you're more like the States or maybe you're more uh, like us. What we're seeing is a lot of interest in medicines that block certain anticholinergic or muscarinic receptors in the body called M1 and M4 receptors. So that's a new field of rational drug design where we're looking for a treatment and we're evaluating, do they work? Are they safe? Uh, so I think that's probably what springs the next good results. Um, but there's also an awful lot of other kinds of treatments coming through. And um, you might be familiar with someone called Dr. Chris Palmer, uh, who's really working on what can be done with diet to help people with various mental health conditions. So that that's one field of research. We're actually uh, having him. Oh, sorry, we're actually having him on the channel this week as well. So looking forward to that's hearing amazing. from him about that too. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah, um, the work he's doing is innovative and really exciting, um, and I, I really hope that there's going to be something that, that comes from that. Um, as a pharmacist, I think it's really important that where we use medicines, we use them optimally. Um, and I would like it to be the case in the future that we're not just relying on very potent antipsychotics to help people. I would like there to be more options. Um, psychedelics. So you, you've probably heard, and, and I think you, indeed, you spoke to a psychiatrist who said that probably we're not going to see the use of psychedelics for uh, psychosis and schizophrenia. But I think what we might see is the increasing Uh, study and use of psychedelics for depression and anxiety and trauma. Um, And I I think there's still work to do to optimize the the medicines that we have. We still know that we don't use the medicines that we already have optimally. Um, We use doses that may be too high, maybe too low. Um, So we still have a lot to learn about how we can make best use of what we already have. So that's, as a pharmacist, that's what I'm really passionate about. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the things that we're seeing most recently is the extension of dosage intervals for depot injections. Okay. So um, we've got a three monthly depot injection, now a six monthly uh, depot injection. So uh, the need to go and have an injection very frequently, like every two weeks, um, is, is not necessarily the case anymore. So that's one example of a recent innovation that I think will improve the quality of life for some people with schizophrenia and psychosis. Right. 
Well, thank you for that kind of overview of where things are at right now. One thing that I think is gaining popularity in the States, I know of, I'm not sure where else, but um, is the development of ways to figure out how or what medication will be most effective for an individual. So, you know, can you speak a bit to that or will there be development of a better way to find out what medications are most effective for an individual? Sure. So I think that it's still quite early days, but there's a field of study called pharmacogenomics. So that's about looking at people's genes and trying to use information um, from their genetic code to establish which medicines are more likely to work, uh, which medicines are more or less likely to cause side effects and problems. Uh, so I think that that's one field that's going to help us to get much better at targeting the medicines that we already have, um, albeit we're not quite there yet. But there are some centers over here in, in England that are looking at uh, pharmacogenomic tests and doing panels for depression. And I think it's fair to say that at the moment, um, it's hard to use that information in clinical practice because you need to know how to interpret it and you need to know how to explain it to someone, you know, that's in a room with you and say, hey, well, you know, it's green for this and it's red for that. So what, what does that really mean? Um, but I think that's one way that moving forwards, we'll get better at being able to pick the right treatment for a person earlier on. And that's mm -hmm. based on, on their genetics. And there is already some chemotherapies that you can make really smart prescribing decisions based on genetic tests. So okay. it can be done. And it's just a matter of time before I think we crack it when it comes to mental health conditions. Wow, great. Well, thank you I've so got much. A question for you, Lauren. Oh, yes. <laughs> before we go. So yeah. um, I don't know if you're interested to, to know a little bit about some of the statistics around um, medicines and, and, and how likely a medicine that gets developed is to come to market. Absolutely. I'd be interested in hearing about that. Okay. So, yeah, I wanted to put this in because, and I, I should have said before, because lots of people have got, you know, really strong views about the pharmaceutical industry and, and, and what they do. Um, but I think there's some really important statistics, and that's that uh, if you think about that process I talked about before with rational drug design, um, around 90% of the, the medicines that are designed and go into to trials actually don't make it. So only one in 10 of the potential medicines actually make it all the way to be a licensed product that we can prescribe and take. Wow. And on average, that process takes 10 to 15 years and it can cost about 1.5 billion pounds to bring a medicine to market. Um, and those are kind of statistics from the London School of Economics. So um, lots of people do criticize the pharmaceutical industry, but they do something really important and, you know, it wouldn't be possible to treat some of the conditions that we can treat today without their science and their innovation and their investment of that money to bring those medicines to market. So I think okay. it's important to acknowledge that. Yeah, no, I think that's great to acknowledge. You know, I think 10 years ago, I found a medication that I really liked, but it wasn't offered as a depot, which I have found to be the best option for me in terms of how to get the medication. And so my psychiatrist was like, oh, don't worry, it's in the works, like it'll be coming soon. But that was 10 years ago, and it's still not here. There's a huge process, you know, that yeah. pharmaceutical companies go through to make sure these medications are safe, effective, and all that stuff. So thank you for bringing that to light as well. Sure. And without being too nerdy, you know, only some medicines can be made as injections. Right. Um, because to have a, a depot injection, uh, you have to put it in the body in such a way that the body gradually metabolizes it and releases it. So if you imagine, a lot of these are kind of medicines where you've got the drug and attached to it is a really long tail of something called a fatty acid. And the body very gradually nibbles away at all of that until the drug gets released and then it can work. Um, and not all of the molecules um, can actually uh, can actually have that chain attached to them. Some of them, it's just not possible. Um, so th there's quite a lot of technical stuff in here. And for your viewers, it might be worth them kind of looking into some of that if they're really interested to learn more about how medicines are designed and some of their properties and where do they go in the body and how long does the body take for them to be flushed out, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean... I, like it boggles my mind that six month injectables are 
possible for it to stay in the body that long and to be effective for that long. So it's kind of cool to hear a bit more from you about what, what that looks like, how that works. So thank you. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for being here to talk with us about the future of medication for schizophrenia, Matt. It was really great. I learned a lot from you again in this video. So thank you so much for being here with us and sharing great your knowledge stuff. and expertise. You're welcome. All right. Take care. Thank you. So thank you so much, Matthew, for joining us today and sharing more about the future of medications used to treat schizophrenia. I think that understanding how medications come to be and where they come from and you know why there is what there is is a bit mystifying sometimes. And so I found it really helpful to hear more about the process of how medications come to be and also some of the things that are currently being looked at and worked on in terms of improving how we treat things like schizophrenia. So thank you so much, Matthew, for joining us today. And thank you to all of you for watching this video. Wishing you and your loved ones good health. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye.